Welcome to the Gritty Podcast, folks. I am your host, Brian Call, and today I am joined by my good friend, Bryce Bishop, and we're in my truck. Yes, so this we is are. A, this is a <laughs> this is an audio only version of the podcast. Trip. We are. Lampers has a bull down, and we're gonna uh, pack them out. Help pack them out. Uh, I just had Bryce and his brother help me pack out my bull the other day, like two days ago, and it's it yep. was so nice because I was like, this is gonna be a three or four day <laughs> yeah. nightmare, you yeah. know, to get this elk out of the back country we're like 10 miles uh, almost so uh, and anywhere elk are it's rough country yeah and so it was rough and it was long long distance so long. i was like this is gonna kill me and <laughs> and then we got all that reinforcements because you got an awesome family we did it all in one day and it was so nice yeah we would have been broken wrecked wrecked I figured this podcast, we'd talk kind of about the hunt a little bit yeah. and just what we, what we're, every hunt you go on, you learn something new. Yeah. And then you have a perspective and I have a perspective that's unique or different, different experiences. Right. So I figure we could just kind of talk about it a little bit. Yeah. That'd be great. So we, we basically headed out to a, an area you guys have been there a couple of times, but I was n- new to this area looking for a place to go hunt. And you guys were like, hey, come on out. You guys live here. Right. And we're in the state of Montana. And in, it's really the only state where you can hunt elk in October with a bow. Yeah, we're, we're so fortunate where we have a six-week bow hunting season. Yeah. Which is pretty unheard of. It's right. It's so awesome. Yeah. Because when everybody else closes down at the end of September, you got like another 18 days or 15 days yeah, or something. I think it shuts down the 18th this year of October. To go and chase elk with a bow. And a lot of people are like, it's funny, if, if you've never experienced elk in October... People seem to think when September 30th gets there, the rut is over. Yeah, you see all those Instagram <laughs> posts and everything. Like, it's over, folks. September's come and gone. And they just think it's done, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's like, I found that October is one of the ruddiest. Yeah. The first 10 days of October and even through the 15th or 16th, I've just seen crazy rut activity. Yeah. I mean, what are we? The, the 10th or the 11th now? Yeah. And just at the gas station talking to a guy he's like i just saw two bulls yesterday right here at the canyon you know came down they're still just screaming chasing cows and it just some of the best elk hunting i think is that first through the 10th about of october i I agree it's just amazing the thing i noticed i noticed about hunting elk that late and this is just anecdotal as i've only done it four or five times well, if you throw in some rifle hunts that you draw, I mean, that's magical because yeah. it's a rut rifle hunt. Yeah. But, like, yeah, last year I was with Anthony and his son Brock, and they had it. He drew that's his right. his son drew that rut tag. Right. It was like bulls were what – I, what I was going to say is what I noticed is once you're getting to late September and early October, elk are – they're all bunched up. By, their, by the time they're that late in the rut – I just find you find 50 elk or no elk. Yeah. You, you find 100 elk or no elk. Yeah. They're not spread out across vast ranges anymore. They're all bunched in 200 elk in one spot. Yeah. I think those bulls have gotten a little tireder. You know, their their motivation to separate cows from each other is waning, and they kind of allow them to come back together and congregate a little bit more, but still hang on, waiting for those final cows to yeah. come to heat. And I have a theory. It's basically like, and I, this is what I think. So <laughs> let me then run this by you, Bryce. We'll see. Okay. In the peak rut, everything's in heat. Yeah. And you got, you know, you got raghorn stealing cows and breeding <laughs> right. them. And right. you got like chaos and madness and a bull has more cows to breed than he can handle you know and so some are getting taken by younger bulls and it's just a it's a nut it's a crazy crazy show yeah different bulls because there's so much demand for breeding 
I think cows settle for whatever they can get to breed them at some point that, right. you know, because it's just, it's just, uh, it's a, it's a primal urge, you yeah. know, to get bred sure. and to do the breeding. So you have cows over here with this bull and that bull and doing this because there's just so many cows in heat at the same time. Right. But as you get toward the end, only us, you know, let's say one out of 50 are coming into heat or whatever. Those days are over, right? Yeah. So the cows that, that are in heat, you know, I think they are drawn to the biggest bulls, yeah, the that, king bull. Yeah, that could be. And, and during the prime rut, they're like, they can't get the affection of <laughs> the king bull. They're, there's too many. Yeah. There's too many ladies, yeah. right? And so I think it seems like the only cows in heat at this point are with the four giant most biggest bulls or the two biggest bulls in a given area. Yeah. They're not wasting time with any bull that's not a monster. Yeah. Whereas earlier in the rut, I see cows get bred by a little five point point, you yeah. know. But that late in the rut, it's like the only bull that those cows seem to select or hang out with is the king. Yeah. And well, and we saw that this year, right? I mean, probably the first three weeks of the season, mm-hmm. it was average five points that had ten, you know, ten or twelve cows yeah. with them. And it wasn't really until about that fourth week that we saw these cows with these bigger bulls um, and starting to group up, you know, bigger into bigger herds. Yeah, I think what happens too is. Once they're in the herd and they've kind of been hanging out, that herd just keeps growing. Yeah. And if a cow's been bred and then she's done, she doesn't seem to leave that herd just yet. She just, they just add to it, add to it, add to it. Yeah. And I think the only game in town with some cows in heat is around that big bull. So what you end up with is all those lesser six by six bulls, raghorns, the ones that, you know, two weeks earlier had their own group. Yeah. They don't have any cows anymore. Right. And they want to be near the cows that are in heat. Yeah. They, they just want to be around those cows. And so what happens, I think, basically you, you look at the cows in heat as the thing that everything orbits around. Right. And since there's only a few and they're with that big bull, every elk in the woods wants to be around those few. Yep. And so what you end up with is just tons of nice bulls but aren't the top dog bull all gathered with the top dog. Like, why are they going to spend time with it anywhere else? Cause the only cows in heat are right there. Yeah. And that they're just drawn to be near the cows in heat. Like there's a chance. So yeah. you're saying there's a chance, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> yeah. So they all, I think they kind of just get around that one herd. And so you'll hear guys say they weren't talking. There's just no elk in the woods. My experience has been, Oh, they're talking. You just got to find them. But there's 200 of them all in yeah. the same cut yep. right now. And it's madness. Yeah. And you can't hear them because you're not in that cut. Right. You think you can. Yeah. Um, well, and we experienced that where we were at, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we were in one drainage and it's like, it's dead. There's nothing here. Not a single. Not a single elk. <laughs> not one. And the day well, I before? Guess, I guess we bumped that little five that's still. Yeah. Somehow he had four or five cows that he managed to keep with it. I told you, I think he was just hanging out with his mom and his yeah, aunts and everything. That's true. Like, uh, yeah, I felt like they are very, they were very vocal and going nuts. And then it's easy to say, well, they've just gone quiet. No, they're not quiet. They just left. Yeah. And then you cover miles, and all of a sudden you stumble on two, three hundred elk in a spot, and you're like, and that's the problem is the whole unit dies except for in the spot where they're at. Right. And that's how I see October. It's either, you know, 50 elk, 70, 100, 200, or, or you're just nothing. Yeah. You don't get those like 10 here, 15 there, groups just cruising all over, kind of chaos, calling in bulls. That late in October, it's just, uh, I did that hunt years ago with Mountain Ops. We called it Elk Ops. And we we were hunting public land, private land. And we had access to the private land. And those elk would come down and feed on the private land, and then they go bed on the public land. And it was chaos. There were 400 elk, you know, 300 elk, all Jeez. moving in one mob everywhere they went that late in the season. They weren't. Yeah broken up into like 
a little bit here, a little bit there. I mean, there was right. just like, they got together, man. Yeah. And I, that's what I keep seeing in October. Right. So the hunting, I think, changes. We were talking about this. If you're a guy that really likes to run and gun, like your brother Patrick. Yep. And just scream and call in bulls and and he's taking advantage of just all the hype and excitement and the bulls are uh there's a cow and heat around every corner and you're really able to take advantage of that that's what a lot of guys think about and dream about when they think about elk hunting right is that moment where you can call in all those bulls yeah and that's been our style of hunting for you know for a long time i mean we'll mix it up every once in a while try different tactics when we need to but you know for as long as i've ever hunted we've always done the call in right we've yeah we've tried to draw those bulls away from wherever they're at to us and get the setup in place and pull them through and and we've had a lot of success with that but you know the last couple years We've, you know, as our, as our family has grown with hunt, the number of hunters, it, it takes us longer in the season to fill all those tags. Right. And so we've been able to experience that spectrum of really the pre rut through the peak rut. Now we're into the post rut and yeah. we're, and we're trying to figure out how to make it work and get it done during that full six week period. And so we've really been able to see the changes that take place in the behavior of those elk as that rut process begins and ends. Right. Um, and the last two years in particular, you know, we've drawn it out into that fifth and sixth week to get it done. And, you know, we've, we've been able to witness firsthand that congregation of all those animals into those bigger herds where those, you know, big bulls are still hanging out. And it's been pretty awesome to, yeah, to experience. I, I think the tactics, my tactics change for sure as the rut sh shifts. Yeah. When I was hunting earlier this year with Brad, the bulls would would rut with cows and then they would go off in bed by themselves. They would wander by themselves. They're kind of looking for the first cows in heat. Yeah. But they didn't commit to a herd or a group or anything. Yep. And you'd have the biggest bulls in the unit would be like t just strolling by themselves. Yeah across huge basin and then they would find some cows kind of run a little bit maybe herd a little bit and then after an afternoon they just walk off and go bed by themselves yeah later in the rut they wouldn't leave those cows right yeah we saw i don't know how many larger bulls in that 315 320 even up to 330 class range even on week three standing by themselves on a hillside just kind of hanging out you know they hadn't really yeah established themselves yet into those herds and you know it, it took really until about that fourth week before those big bulls really started just permanently hanging out with those cows and i i think that those tactics can change you know early versus mid to late yeah for sure we got in there and it was pretty late because it's already into october you guys filled some tags earlier in the year yep i was with you guys for a couple of days, like two days, day and a half. And then I hunted by myself and kind of got to explore the area and the unit and learn it, you know. And when you're this late into the season, and my goal is to kill a herd bull, you know, yeah. I really want to go for an old, older bull. And it, I have found that I'm much better. I can kill a herd bull if I don't do calling. Right. It's It's sort of... Like I could, if I do calling, I can kill in, call, call in quite a few younger bulls, yeah. but I can't kill the biggest bull in the area. And that's kind of what I would like to do. Right. And so. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? <laughs> yeah. So as I've progressed uh, in, in hunting and my goals have sort of changed, because in the beginning, I just wanted to kill an elk. Right. You know, and I just wanted to call, experience some call-ins and bulls charging in. I didn't care how big they were. Yeah. And and it was really fun. Well, yeah, I mean, you heard Patrick yesterday, I think, when we were talking about this, and he was saying, any six-point, right, any six-point, um, with that call-in method. And when so many tags we had to fill, it was just like, if a decent bull walks in, you know, it's not raggy looking. Take him. It's going down. Yeah. 
And we just had to do that to fill all the tags that we had. But, you know. And you're feeding your family with the game meat yeah. and the whole deal. And you want these kids to experience yeah. these moments. And Patrick was showing me home video of this stuff last night. And I was looking at it and I was like, <laughs> you see some giant, some beautiful six. I mean, this public land, general tag stuff. And these beautiful bulls just come walking down in the grass, you know, in these yeah. meadows. And they just stop like 30 yards from his son and just goes, you know, and the kid's like 12 years old. And then the bull turns and goes broadside. And it's like, dude, what? I mean, people, we live for that. Yeah. You know, as Western hunters and it's incredible. And you get that from those, from calling like that, you know? And so it's a, I think it's a great tactic. But for every bull you call in like that, there's quite a few young bulls that come. But you end up shooting when you have that style. Kind of, you pass maybe if you're being trying to be selective. But you end up doing a lot of call-ins, and you're and you're not shooting a lot of animals. Yeah. If you're if you're me, and I found that the biggest bulls in the area generally they don't leave those cows. Right. Unless you have this magic. Like you get between him and his cows or, or you're, you somehow get him pissed off and he's in the right mood. And then you can get one of those giant bulls to like make a little mistake. But I have found I'm much more deadly if I never make a peep, play the wind as much as I can, but, but kind of pattern the bulls, stalk them. I'll, I'll try to be patient. I'm waiting for my opportunity to strike day after day after day. And it's a different tactic. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, from, from the style that we have have used for so long to then mix it up and, and see a totally new approach mm-hmm. that you were taking, it was very educational. And, you know, I think you were just as successful of getting into elk, being surrounded by elk, having opportunities but waiting for the right opportunity as our style of trying to call them in. And so... Uh, you know, we're super excited to to be able to take some of that knowledge that, that we gained, you know, from me being with you if, uh, those few days and try that next year. You know, and, and depending on the time of the season that we're in, mm-hmm. deploy those different tactics to see if we can be even more successful than we have been able to be. Yeah, I, having spent a lot of time doing some tree stand stuff and, and ambush hunting, I spent a lot of time figuring out where what the wind does yeah like trying to understand thermals and how they operate and where i can get into places so an animal can't smell me but i'm right in their bedroom right and a lot of times i've told you in oregon especially trees are your best friend you know yeah (laughs) their trees get your scent up in ways that um change the game yeah. I mean, there's a lot, there's a big reason why out east and Midwest, you know, you, these whitetail guys, they kill those monsters from trees. Right. Out west, you know, you can kind of sit in ambush in some areas like what I did on this hunt using terrain features that kind of allow you to get in tight, but the terrain and the way the land is shaped and the way the wind blows, you can control your thermals a little, little bit. Yeah. And that's that was my struggle. I was hunting solo for five days. And in that period, I was just kind of, I keep a diary. And I'm going out and I'm finding what the wind is doing in the morning, in the evening, what time of day it switches, what those thermals do, and what the weather pattern kind of is in that spot. And I'm able to find areas where the elk want to be and where I can get within 200 or 150 yards of the herd without being detected and the goal is to find an ambush point where i'm in bow range yeah and then i wait for that bull to sort of make a mistake and come to me areas i i told you the day we got here i was like i said hey guys you got a spot where where you've hunted where the wind is just it does the same thing in the morning evening and afternoon like (laughs) where the wind blows one way the whole time because I love hunting areas like that. I feel like I'm sneaky so I can kill. You give me a consistent wind pattern. I will, 
I will sneak right to that bull's, you know, bedroom and shoot him. Yeah. How well did that work for you this time? <laughs> you guys were like, no, this is pretty much the most swirly, windiest area we're going to take you to. I'm like, oh, thanks. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like the enemy of, of, uh, the of the bow hunter in, in my style, you know, winds that just blow in all different directions all day, no matter morning, evening, night, nothing's reliable. Versus an area where it's like it blows hard straight down these because I, I do hunt a lot of steep, steep country. And when you're in that kind of country, the wind does tend to just come downhill uh, at night, evening, morning. And then when it gets warm, that wind just blows uphill and it never changes. Yeah. And so if you have a bull below you in the afternoon, you have wind is not your you don't have to deal with wind. Sure. It's just everything else. Yeah. It's just being sneaky. It's using folds in the land. It's it's belly crawling, butt sliding, you know, um, being patient, only moving when the wind gusts, stuff like that to get into position. Yeah. But the wind, the wind is uh, the hardest thing to beat, I think. Yeah, for sure. And so having an area like this where the wind is left, right, up, down, like everywhere, yeah. I'm like, you can't, you can't even hardly get halfway onto a stock before it's over. Yeah. And, you know, that's something that we've struggled with. You know, whenever we have hunted in that area, it's just, it's almost so frustrating. You're just like, I'm leaving, right? I'm going to a new yeah. area because it's just like so hard. And I, and I think, and you'll probably get into it, but the knowledge that we gained from those diaries that you were keeping helped us kind of understand that, you know, even though we might've been checking wind and it seemed like, oh, the wind's blowing right down to where we think those elk are. The reality is with those, those topography changes and things a hundred yards from where we're standing, that wind was doing a totally different thing. Yep. And so I think that we are able to now approach that area differently um, and not assume that, oh, the wind's going to bust us if we go right down here. Um, because now we know, well, in this section, yeah, it's going to it's gonna come across right here instead of continue to go down or go mm -hmm. up or whatever. And yeah, I was able to find some areas and certain spots where, and I don't understand it all the time, like why it happens this way. But yeah. I'm, I go out and I kind of keep track of these things and I'm able to go, okay, on this point, on this face, there is a, for some reason, there's a prevailing wind that just rips across it. Only right here. Yeah. A hundred yards behind me, it blows straight uphill and then down and across. But right here, 80% of the time, it blows right here. Yeah. And you're like, wow, that's pretty consistent. Yeah. That's better than any other spot I've been sitting. Yeah. And I, th I think that has to do with like some kind of overwhelming um, thermal that overpowers all the rest because of its location in the canyon overall. Then the other thermals pick up here and there as the sun comes up and the heat changes and the coolness from the river bottom changes. And right. But what I'm able to do is go, okay, if I sit right here, it's mostly doing this the whole time. And then I can see which way it's blowing and I'm like, well, it's so steep right here. That wind is going straight up with momentum and yeah. those thermals and it's not going over the ridge and then up to where the elk are bedded. And I can have elk right on the ridge above me and, and the wind blowing straight toward them, but it doesn't blow up over the lip. It blows up and goes straight into the sky. Right. And when you start playing with those little milkweeds and stuff, yeah. those little uh, feathers you can get at the, and you start throwing them out to see what they do. Right. You really learn wind patterns. You can watch that thing float and go, oh, that's what my wind does. Yeah. And on that one sp space, because I found a little spot through trial and error where I was like, okay, if I sit right here, I can sit here all day from morning till dark, and I can have 100 elk to my right, 50 in front of me, 50 behind me, another 100 in, you know, to yeah. my left, 360, I have elk surrounding me, and they don't know I'm there. Right. Because of that terrain feature in the way the wind blows. Yeah. And I tried around a wallow you guys sent me uh, to. I was like, okay, this is a heavily active wallow area. And I was sitting there on this wallow and I experimented different times of day in different spots. And one of the ways to see if, you, if it works 
is to have elk come in. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And <laughs> I told you, well, four out of 10 times I get busted no matter where I sit on this wallow. Yeah. But six out of 10, maybe seven. That I had some good six by sixes come in, not, not the bull I was after, but come in and stand in front of me at 40, 50 yards yeah. and mess around in the wallow. And I was like, okay, I, you know, they didn't smell me. An hour later, different group comes in, they detect me. Yeah. Another hour later, a different group comes in, they don't, de- and I can feel the wind going, okay, but it lasts 20 minutes, right? And then right. in this area, it's like at any minute, it shifts and goes shift. down. It's like, the game is up. Yep. You can start to go, okay, I can live with that. It's something, right? All I need is the wind to hold for a certain 20 or 30 minutes at the same time a giant comes in, which I almost had. (laughs) I'm at full draw. Bull, I'm like, you're dead. Bull's dancing in the wallow, mud (laughs) flicking everywhere. He's screaming, peeing on himself. I'm like, come on, baby, come on. I'm, I'm at full draw. I only want him to take a step. Everything's perfect. Wind hits me. Yeah. And I felt it instantly. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Bull pulls his head up. He smelled me like in a hot second. And it was just done. Butts and dust. Gone. Yep. Yep. So that spot, I started to go, mm, I want something more consistent. Because my goal when I am out there, and this is with any animal I'm trying to kill, I don't want them to ever know I'm there. Right. And so I would give up the wallow location because there's elk figuring it out every now and then. Yeah, I would go hunt the wallow for a day or two, but if I'm going to go down there every day after one critter trying to wait for that one to come within range of me and stuff, I'd rather get to a spot where they never know I'm there every day because yeah. they're going to they're going to start to pick up that you're at the wallow and words going to get out yeah. and <laughs> all the elk quit going <laughs> to that spot and right. you know so that other spot is my favorite because they're not able to to detect you in that spot. Yeah. And then I was able to sneak down and see what I could get away with. Because well, I thought it was really when I walked over there and you were kind of showing me how you set up in that area, mm-hmm. you know, those paths that you kind of cleared out from one spot to the next to the next, just to allow you to silently navigate around that uh, without being detected was... I mean, you had four or five different spots just in that one place that you could set up for different shot angles, depending on what the elk were doing. And Yeah. I, there's a lot of t- timber. Yeah. And so you have these shot windows that are 60, 70 yards, 50 yards that are really good shot windows. But there's so many trees yeah. that you got to move six feet left to get this shot and right. seven feet right and, you know, to get this one. And you never know where that elk is going to be standing. Yeah. Right. And so I'm on the hillside I'm on, there's pine cones and needles that have gathered there for a hundred years. Yeah, it was crazy. (laughs) And you walk on these sticks and broken sticks and you just make so much noise. And it was so dry this year. Every little thing just crunch, crunch. So on this face that I'm sitting on, it drops off in front of me precipitously into a canyon that the elk love to be in. Uh, not a canyon, but a like a Basin. ravine, a cool, coulee. Like, yeah. And there's aspens in it and wallows, and they love to spend all this time down there. Well, if I stay on that face, the wind blows left to right. And now occasionally when it does blow up my back and goes down the hill, well, those elk are elevation-wise 100 feet below me because the hill rises so fast. So even though that wind is blowing straight at them, you throw a weed out and you'll see that wind just goes straight over the top of those elk. Right. And it just, and so I quit freaking out when my wind blew downhill because I knew it was blown over the top. And then when I had 75 elk underneath me, anywhere from 30 yards to 200 yards out and not one of them detected me and the wind's blowing straight to them, you realize that thermal is just going over the top. Right. And and I think normally when you'd use like a wind checker, just a wind checker, you'd think, oh, my wind's blowing straight down into him. I can't be right here. Right. And you'd avoid that like the plague. And, you know, again, it's very educational for us to go in and see, you know, and when I just was sitting there with you and, you know, it was dead at that point. There weren't any elk in there, but that allowed us to have a conversation really actually and 
and kind of walk around the walk place. around and, and kind of see how you set it up and then talk about those thermals and witness it firsthand and and just kind of see how that was you know how that wind was acting i mean we have huge confidence now that if we can go in there getting down in doesn't really matter what the wind's doing as we're working our way to that spot once we're there we know we're going to be safe right they these elk are either in the cut on the left side or the right side and as you move into the position we would hike down there in the dark and you're walking down the ridge top and the wind is at your back kind of blowing straight down the ridge well the elk are in the lower, again, in the lower parts of the the ravine on the, each side of that ridge you're w- walking. Right. And so I I found, like, they're not on the ridge at that time. Yeah. So my wind's blowing straight down on the ridge. They come up and bed in that timbered ridge in the afternoon, but right. not in the morning. They're in those meadows in the bottom of the draw. Yeah. So it's like sneak in, get on the face, boom. Then the wind switches, elk move around, they don't know you're there. Right. And that herd bull I was after, he would, there was a natural funnel. And this is what you do when you're <laughs> trying to hunt whitetails or anything. Right. Uh, you're looking for those pinch points, a fence line where the fence is knocked down and they walk through that all the time. Yeah. Or, you know, there's a saddle. Elk just want to go through that saddle. They don't want to hike any, you know, 300 feet higher than they have to. They want to go through that saddle. Right. And this place is a narrow funnel. It's really, it's really wide. And then all of a sudden it becomes a 120 yard yeah. uh, wide funnel. And the entire herd would ride around. That's they, I was between their feeding area and their bedding area. Yeah. And those elk would move from their bedding area or their feeding area from all night, full moon, rutting and all that. And then as the sun was coming up, while the wind was still blowing downhill in their face, they like to move up the draw where they can smell, yeah. hit that funnel, and then I'm right on the funnel. Yeah. So I know those elk are going to pass in that 100-foot window, 100-yard window rather, 150-yard window. Right. And I just need that bull to come within 60 yards, 70 yards, and I'm going to smoke him. And it worked like a charm. The only problem I had was to get the shot I wanted, depending on where the bull was, um, if the bull showed up before 830, I ran the risk of getting detected because the wind still blowed. You know, they, they're coming up the mountain while the wind is in their face. Yeah. And there's that possibility that the wind would blow downhill and kind of drift down a little bit if I got too close to the funnel. Because right. it would suck into the draw. So uh, there were days, though, where elk rut, the moon is out, they get distracted, they're stupid, yeah. and they fight some other bull, and they're late. They're late to get to their bedding area. And that happened a couple of times where now the wind is at their back as yeah. they're moving into their bedding area. Because they got started too late in their right. you know, journey back. They don't like to do that, but they do it a lot, especially when the rut is going on. They just, it kind of takes over and they make poorer decisions. Yeah. So when that happened, that was ideal. It was like, okay, now I can get right on the edge of the funnel that they're going to walk by. Wind is, they're, they're, it's blowing in my, my face at their back. Now they're going to walk by and I'm going to have a super, like a 40 yard shot. Right. When they were coming up earlier, and the, and the wind was hard in their face, I was looking at a 65, 70-yard shot. And the those are per, that's a perfectly fine shot for me as long as it's not a rushed shot. Right. Like, the longer the range, the more it's like, okay, I need time. I need to get know the exact yardage. I like to be able to shoot comfortably. I don't want to have to hurry. Yeah. And what I was finding was... Um, these elk kept, they only made the mistake a couple of times. And when, when they did, and I was right where I needed to be, the bull didn't play by the script. Yeah. He chased some bull off and he's a, now he's 75 yards instead of right when the little trail he normally takes and he won't stop. Yeah. He won't stop for nothing. He's running around screaming. And that's one of the harder parts. I think in later, later in the season, when you're dealing with big herd bulls is they never stop moving. Yeah. And so you every time you range and you go to draw and then they like chase this and they go there and they rut this cow and it's like hold still for a second. <laughs> stop. And I think that's pretty 
par for the course. And anyway, I really enjoyed, but we were talking about that face. Um, you know, I got stockasins on. Usually I got some or some socks, something that I can move through the trees pretty quietly with. But that ground was so loud and you have those grasses and those uh, yeah. balsa root uh, old stalks and it's it's the loudest thing. Yeah. And so I, like you said, I took a rock and I scratched basically um, a pathway it down to dirt. Yeah. Kind of like what I would do if I had a tree stand for a whitetail and I'm sneaking into a spot. I'd set my tree stand. If I'm going to go to that spot multiple times, when I walk in in the dark, for example, I want there to be silence. Silence, yeah. And so I might rake the trail before, you know, ahead of time. So it's the same scenario. I cleared that ground. So I ha from the top of the hill as I enter the face of this slope where I would sit in ambush, I just cleared out the ground, like yeah. you said. And I had like a few different pathways and shooting positions. And it worked like a charm. It just not on the bull I wanted. And so I was able to just walk around all over right in front of these elk. And they're not looking at me because it's silent. It's just dirt. Yeah. Dirt. And I have no boots on. Right. And you're just like walking. And you just move slow like this low hand of a clock. And and uh, they don't see the movement and they don't hear it. And so I was able to, I had a nice six on a wallow yeah, that was right below me. And they would hit the wallows every now and then. And I wanted to be able to kill the herd bull if he hit one of those wallows. Well, the only way I was going to be able to move 30 or 40 yards left or right to get these different shots on these different wallows on the slope I'm on is if the ground is clear and I have a little like pathway, I can just move yeah. over there. Right. And sure enough, it worked. Just the bull I wanted never got in the wallow. <laughs> um, but as I was keeping notes on wind, what works, what doesn't work. Um, I continue to risk things. Um, you get in a moment where you're like, man, if I drop off this ledge, I know the wind is going to blow straight down there. But right. you're like, but if, but if I drop I off this ledge, I yards. have a 40 yard shot. <laughs> and you like, you think it never works, but yeah. you're like, I'm going to cheat the wind. Yep. I'm going to beat the wind. <laughs> and you, and sure enough, I had that herd bull I was after, big seven. And I, I was like, oh, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. And I got too excited. And he was standing there raking this tree. And I could see 30 cows below him right in my wind pattern if I dropped 10 yards. But I needed to drop 10 yards to get the shot because the trees blocked my, yeah. my, uh, my shot. And I'm like, I'll drop 10 yards and I'll just draw and shoot. And I'll do it before they spook. <laughs> yeah. Well... Your wind move instantly. Yep. You you're, you just aren't fast enough. Nope. You can't beat the wind. Nope. So as soon as I dropped that 10 yard, they all smelled me. Ooh. Like I knew it. I knew it was ahead of time. And what I should have done was been more patient and hoped that bull moved. I should have, I should have known better than to cross my safe zone. Right. I knew if I dropped right there, my scent would drop. And yet I just thought, ah, maybe I'll get away with it. And, and it didn't pay off. And then they ran off and the, the hunt was done. Had I stayed where I was at, there's a good possibility he walked within 40 yards in, in one yeah. of those openings. He was, he was wandering all over the place yeah. right there. And I, sh I think I could have killed him. We just get too excited. I mean, your blood gets going. You're like, this is it. This is my chance. And you just stop thinking and you just make dumb mistakes. And nine times out of ten, you blow it. But if you're too conservative, which I look back on, I yeah. could have shot that bull at 65 yards two or three times, five, ten times, really, if I had been willing to stop him with a cow call. Sure. And then kind of range him and dial, you know, or, or just guess his yardage, set it at something I think he's at because I could mark the trail. But yeah. he could be anywhere from 60 to 70 on that trail, and I couldn't. It was hard to be able to tell. So I was like, well, I'll dial sure. the 65. When he walks across that trail, I'll go, yeah, stop him with a cow call, and I'll either shoot high or low. Yeah. I just wasn't comfortable with that. Well, and that blows it up anyways, right? I mean, you know, you make that decision, you shoot a bad shot, you miss. Then they instantly know something's not right. Right. You know. So there's a balance, I think, between being aggressive and taking risks 
right. might pay off. I mean, at some point, you always have to. Right. Um, I think I could have killed that big bull. Um, probably could have killed him if I had, as he came through the gap, just been at full draw and just cow called and shot a little higher low based on where he was standing. I knew where basically 70 yards was and where 60 yards was and where 65 was. And right. I could cheat up or down and I probably would have smoked him. Yeah. But I've also been in that situation where I've done the cow call or made sounds and the bull just hit there in the zone and they just, they don't they care. Don't, yeah, they just keep moving. But the cows, they all care. And you got 20 cows that swing their head up at you. Yeah. And they're like, where's the elk on the hill? Yeah. And they don't see one. And then, it's, and then the whole thing blows up. Yeah. So I prefer to have the bull stop on his own. Um, now, if he was 40 yards or 30 yards and, and I don't. You know, once you start getting further range, I need to know more exact yardage. I need a more precise, I need more time. Now, on a quick 30-yard shot, it's like I can use my 30 or my 40-yard pin. You know, I, yeah. I, I can get away with a lot of margin of error. Sure. Um, so it was, it's like I lean toward conservative, playing it safe. I, I had patience. I'm like, if I don't get them today and they don't know I'm here, I'll probably do the same thing tomorrow. Right. If I don't get him that day, I'll do the same thing the next day. And sure enough, four days in a row, yeah. it worked. He just didn't quite give me that shot moment I was looking for. And then, um, and then on day five, you came in because I'm right. like, you, you got this is cool. And I was passing bulls left and right, sending you some po photos and pictures of bulls <laughs> in front of me. I'm like, yeah. I, I knew you. You were like, well, I'd shoot that bull. So it was it was time for you to come in and join me. And I kind of wanted to show you the area and what, what I was experiencing so that uh, if you guys go back to that area, you can kind of see what I was talking about. Right. Well, and, and for me, I just, I was, I had been out hunting the weekend before, you know, I, I had a lot of stuff on my plate getting ready to launch the peak skaters and just, I was, in a position where I was like, I should not go hunting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I have too much to do right now. Yeah. But I've got a great wife that really supports hunting. Mm -hmm. And I was getting, you know, those text messages and the updates from you. And she was like, I, I'm busy with my schedule and teaching. And you need to get back out there and you need to go. And so I just made that decision to drop everything and, and come back in and you needed more food anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how long I'm going to be in here. I'm just, I'm staying until I kill. Uh, after seeing some of the bulls, I'm like this, I'm it's, it's like, you're right on the verge, you know, yeah, you're just close. You're close. It just need another day, another day, another day. And, yeah. um, and, uh, so when you came in, we went, we went to the, the spot where I'm like, it's been hot for five days. Not a single bugle. Yeah. Just dead. 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 They left. They completely left. Went to another area. So that was kind of uh, a bummer because I was like, but I was, I was sitting there going, look, I showed you all the video. I, I showed you there <laughs> yeah. was elk I know. Here. There was I, a question there, in my mind. I'm like, Brian. <laughs> I'm like, dude, this place was hopping. Yes. <laughs> the last five days, I swear to you. Yeah. And I was showing you video on my camera and of the bull I was really targeting and yeah, it was just off the chain for those days, and then it was, then it was dead. They left, and they spooked. I don't know what caused them to spook. It wasn't me. They were really high on the hill, nowhere near me. Wind was nowhere near them. They couldn't see me or hear me. You know where I was at. They, I was a little discouraged the day they spooked because normally they're within 150 yards of me, bedded, yeah, screaming and rutting, and I just need that bull to come within range. Um, and on that day, they were 400 yards above me up in the timber. And I'm like, hmm, today may not be that fun. And then all of a sudden, hundreds of elk just just left the basin. Yeah. So we went back in the next day. But I, had, I wasn't sure if they were going to come back after the way they spooked out. Right. Sure enough, they did not come back. So... You and I went to a new area. Yeah. We're like, where's the where's the where's the action? <laughs> sure enough, we we found where the action was a few miles in another direction. We we I never saw the bull I was after, but another herd, right. and it was massive. 
couple hundred elk. I don't know how many two hundred. I don't. Yeah, I mean, like you said, it was just bodies on bodies on bodies, just in the grass, just laying there. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I couldn't know tell. There were, but. but I was sitting here going, I don't like this spot. Yeah, I don't like this spot at all. Yeah, it's chock full of elk, but this is so unhuntable compared to the terrain features and the wind patterns and the thermals in the other area. Right. It's a sort of, I told you a while ago, um, I kind of have a mantra where I'm like, hunt the area, you know, n- hunt the unit, hunt the area, not the bull. Uh, some areas are just made for bow hunting and an animal's killable in that area. Yeah. Other areas are not made for bow hunting. And I've made the mistake years ago where there's some animal you're like, I want that one. But you're almost in a futile position trying to kill him there because he's so unkillable. Well, it, that's like this. I, I was thinking there's no way this is going to work. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and I've the only solace I have, the only consolation I have is I've seen situations like that in a spot and stock scenario uh, where, or just in a hunting scenario where I'm like, doesn't look possible. But I'm like, let's move, let's try to get 30 yards closer and then see what happens. Right. Oh, wow. That, and then you see a fold over here and you're like, well, I think I can get to that. And you move 20 yards closer and you're like, oh, my wind's holding. I might have to. And then next thing you know, you're in bow range. Yeah. You're, you're like, this isn't possible to, wow, we're right here. And that's, so I, I kind of nowadays uh, don't necessarily give up on a situation, but right. our attitude was, you're there one day, right. basically, day and the, the next morning you had. Right. So we're going to gamble more. And this isn't the area I've cultivated, you know, where I don't want to be detected and all that. This is an right. area where we're like, let's blow it up right. if we have to. Right. Because I want elk to split up, scatter, do something because... We need chances. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't the best area, but we approached it the best we could and then... Um, we were 250 yards from the elk, roughly, when we when we found... We knew we could hear them, but when we had eyes on them and we could see hundreds of elk, um, we are about 250. Right. And I'm like, wow, we got to close 150 yards on 200 head of elk um, through this stupid, loud grass, stock, crackly yeah. plants. And I was just like... And the wind is going back and forth. I'm like, this is un- this is going to be a wreck. <laughs> yeah. But I also thought, with this many elk, and there was a bunch of nice sixes pestering, probably a 340 bull yeah. in the mix. And you're just like, man, in this situation, you never know. Why not try to get within 120 yards of the herd, 100 yards? And then you never know if some bull just gets chased right to you right. or, or, you know, some, so, something, they just all get up and walk right in front of you. Yeah. So I was like, let's just, let's just try, try. <laughs> and so you and I, um, basically got on our butts and we just inched our way down. Had you ever done that before? No, no. And I was like, I can't believe we're doing this. <laughs> like sitting on the ground, our bows on our laps, kind of, crab walking sliding squish you know, <laughs> squeezing around these crunchy little bushes and stuff i mean i was like this is kind of ridiculous right in front of them right in front of them yeah yeah and yeah. i was like move like the slow hand of clock like just move little by little right in front of their faces and as long as you move slow and you're low like that yeah bows on your lap sometimes if the ground wasn't so crunchy i just have my bow on the ground next, next to me to yeah. and I just move it and then I would move myself and right. I move my bow and then I move myself. But the ground is so loud and the bow crackling against that tinfoil bush and all yeah. that. It's just, it was, it's like leaves on the ground. It's just too loud. So put it on my lap and you just inch your way down. And I told you, let's get to that, to that hump on this. Uh, and then we'll be within a hundred yards right. of the herd, like 105. And, uh, and sure enough, it was, yeah. but we were worried about the wind because the wind kind of blows across and down every now and then right. toward the elk right? and uh, toward the tail end of this herd. We talked about different approaches. 
to to get on the herd. Part of the strategy was you have to deal with the wind, you yep. have to deal with the terrain, and then you have to deal with what if they get up and move, which way are they going to go? Right. Because I want to be where they want to go. Right. So that we kind of blended all those decisions together to get to a certain point and then just hope something worked out. And I've done that where I get within a hundred or 75 yards of the edge of the herd. And then I just sit there and I might sit there six hours and then I might go back to my tent that night and it's, you know, it's what it was. Yeah. But usually if I can get in there, crazy things happen. Yeah. So that was a strategy. Well, and I think that uh, what we've experienced sometimes in, in other areas that we've hunted is, you know, we'll get to that 100, 100 yard, 150 yard mark and we'll sit there and we'll just watch and we'll watch and we'll watch and we'll just try to see, are they going to get up? Are they going to move or whatever? And ultimately, in that amount of time, our wind would bust us, you know, to right. where it was like, we just spent too much time sitting in the same spot watching instead of actively trying to make a play. Right, right. And, and it blew up on us. And in, in, that, this, in that area, yeah. other areas, like I said, when that wind is not reliable, right. that's a, that is a major player in uh, your approach, I think. Yeah. But in this situation, you know, we had a fairly consistent crosswind that would go down every once in a while. Yep. And that allowed us just to keep inching forward and forward and forward until, you know, we got to that point where we wanted to be. It worked pretty good. It, it mean, really did. Um, I was shocked. I was like, this is not going to work. <laughs> My butt hurts from sitting on all these rocks on the ground as we're sliding. Or, you know, it was like. It's a whole lot better than belly crawling, though. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Like, yeah. I used to crawl all the time and yeah. like a snake. And it's like. Yeah. This is way more comfortable. You just sit there and inch your way down. Maybe you're back on your elbows a little bit. Well, and I, you know, I'd be focused on don't make a sound, you know, sneak around this bush. And then I'd look and you're like clear over to my right. I'm like, how did he just get over there? Because navigating all those nature alarm bushes. <laughs> it was crazy. I have found in those situations, the elk make a lot of noise. Yeah. And so uh, if I don't, if I make noises that are kind of slow and they're loud, but they're just like, I'm crunching like an elk, maybe right. just kind of grazing. Well, and the other they thing, they don't really look around. Yeah. And the other thing I, I, you know, watched and learned you do is when we did hear that wind coming, those kind of gusts of wind every once in a while, mm -hmm. as soon as that would kind of hit our location, it was move a little faster, move a little faster, move a little faster. Yeah. And let that wind uh, kind of act any, as a buffer. Yeah, any sound, any noise. It's like you move when the wind is covering your your sound, and then you freeze when the wind stops. Right. And it's kind of like red light, green light. Yeah. This is the game, and yeah. and you're just like okay, and you have to have that discipline to stay still when everything goes silent. Right. And you want to go. Well, oh, I'm so close. Let's just inch. It's like they hear that. Yeah. Um. Well, there was and a, then there were several times where, you know, earlier in the day, you know, before we got to where we had eyes on them, you'd make a crunch and you'd hear a bugle, you know, from a long ways yeah. off. They would hear that and go, who's out there? Yep. Yep. Um, so. Which is another thing I, I tend to prefer. I, I, I don't mind crunching and making noise and then they go, Bruh! and they scream because they heard you from 200 yards away. Right. They heard a sound. And they're like, who's out there? And I freeze and I just be quiet. A lot of hunters might cow call back and say, I'm just a cow. Yeah. Well, I think that's a bad idea most of the time. Unless your strategy is a bunch of calling and all of that. And, and it's just you're relying heavily on it. Where I'm not, I find that when they bugle and they don't get a response, it almost makes them really curious. Yeah. And they don't spook. But I find like if I call back to them. Now they're like, they know something is there. Right. And in a public land, general tag kind of scenario, I think they've been called to, old bulls especially, old cows, they've been called to for 15 years. Yeah. 18 years. They're kind of like, okay, I have one of two options. That's a hunter or it's an elk. They've been decoyed so many times. They're, I think 
those elk on public land, they're just wise to it, man. Yeah. Uh, on general tags, they're wise to the fact that every call they hear might not be an elk. Yeah. Might be a human. In other areas, I've observed where it's a tag takes 20 years to draw, they just never get decoyed very often. Right. And so when they hear a cow call, they're under the assumption that it's a real cow. Yeah. But elk aren't stupid. They don't get old for a reason. <laughs> right. For no reason. I think they, they figure it out. They know the game. So I'm like, you know what? I don't even want them to know that there's... I don't want to tell them anything. I want to leave them just wondering. So I don't give in to the urge to cow call and say, I'm, I'm just a cow. I just, I just let them wonder. Yeah. And I keep sneaking in. But as we came down that slope and we got into position, all hell broke loose because our wind yeah. finally blew across. We got low enough that the crosswind blew across us and then kind of drifted down toward the tail end yep. of the herd. So only the, the, the corner, the one edge of the herd was able to smell us, like maybe the last 10 or 15 cows. Yeah. The lower we dropped, the more it hit. It would just keep hitting as it's blowing diagonally down toward them. Right. So it was like, but it was, it was the side that it was hitting the, the side of the herd in the direction they didn't want to go. Right. So we were, it was kind of a good, a good. It worked out perfectly. I mean, you know, those, those 10 or so cows that we kind of got busted on and they kind of got up and, and ran across. Kind of, yeah, kind of started moving the whole group in the direction that we were trying to to go. Right. Um, and that was so that that it was upsetting because you're like, dang it! I wanted yeah. to get to within a hundred seventy five and just sit here, yeah, and uh, wait for that bull as he just chased an elk everywhere, and he yeah. he just wandered wide and far, constantly screaming, raking, just rutting hard. And I, I kind of wanted to just sit in ambush, wait for him to come within range and, and get him. But once they started to blow up and they got up and started walking away, a bunch of the elk didn't move. And when you have herds that big, when some elk freak out, the rest of the elk don't because they didn't smell it. And you have just so many elk um, that there's just a lot of chaos. Yeah. And... Once those elk spooked, though, that really got the bulls like. <laughs> yeah, they were going, what's going on? They start screaming. They start rutting. Yeah. They start going, wait, 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 what's going on? What's going on? Stay still. you know. And then you have other bulls that can hear those bulls. And, and the other whole, because there's a, like four herds there, with different herd bulls, you start to have them like go. Oh, you stay over there. No, yeah. you stay over yeah. there. And I'll kill you. <laughs> Don't come over here. And I'm like, well, Bryce, it's about to get, <laughs> it's about to turn into a rodeo. Yeah. And uh, at that point, I, I started to, uh, I, I basically was like, well, we're kind of busted. So we need to close the distance faster now. Yeah. And so uh, we got to the bench, hustled to the edge. Now we're within 190 yards of the herd. And a bunch of the elk are now getting up, and they're walking across up. us. Yeah, yeah, below us, below us. Um, and you just start seeing tons of elk just stand up and start. Yeah. You're like, they're just appearing everywhere. <laughs> and at that point, I was like, okay, we're in the wide open on a on a ridge, and they are starting to walk toward another herd. And yeah. that that bull in the other herd is madder than hell. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and. He did not want them to come over, but they were coming no matter what, and it was just about to get crazy in there. So at that point, I was like, well, I want to be in between those two herds as they collide. Right. I, I want to take advantage of what's about to go down and the bulls just being careless. Yeah. But if I were to just kind of sneak down there, there's no way you're going to get past those elk. No. There's too many eyeballs everywhere you're in the wide open you're a human form yet i need to close the distance and so one of the techniques i've used a lot as I, especially as i've hunted open country um is <laughs> the i don't know what to call it we call it decoying i don't know either right? <laughs> but i um you know you got a backpack on you, you basically hunch over and the dude behind you grabs your waist or whatever 
and he's hunched over and you just walk like a four legged animal, like right in front of right. him. <laughs> and in, uh, we did this in open country. I did this years and years ago with Anthony and Ben and we had a heads up decoy, just the head. And we put that head in front of us and w- the three of us would just hunch over <laughs> like a giant moose or all these legs are moving and you're not in a sh- uh, human shape anymore. And we would just walk in front of 200 elk right toward them or walk right past them. And they look over there and they look at that and they look for a minute and then they go back to feeding. Like they're like, I guess it's a cow. I guess yeah, it's a something. moo cow or a moose or, but they don't go alarm. That's a, that's a human. Right. You stand upright or you crouch or it's just a single form. I don't get away with that. The way I do, if there's two of us at a minimum, three works really well too, but two people, I'm like, Bryce, hunch over, <laughs> grab my waist. We are going to like walk straight toward this herd and we're going to head them off. And, and that's uh, another point where I was like, this is not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I remember as a kid, and I think I told you this, my dad saying, you know, if you're walking through the woods and you kind of hunch over and you're walking that way, elk might just mistake you for another elk. And I was, I was like, there's no way that's going to work. And now here we are and you're like, okay, bend over. Just stay right behind me. We're going to sneak in on Stay tight. Things. Stay tight. And I'm like... This is not going to work, but okay, <laughs> let's try it. And I'm like, Brad, Brad and I did it almost daily on our open country hunt earlier in the season. You just hunch over at 100, 200 yards and walk right in front of the elk. And it's amazing what you get away with. Now, sometimes they'll just yeah. blow up and run away, but I'd say eight out of ten times, they just look at you and then go back to feeding. Yeah, and I, you you got to have the right pace, you yeah. know? Right. You got to kind of plod along like an elk. And so these elk were walking like in, in, in about a 10 foot wide group, butt to butt, you know, walking their way parallel to us. And we're just walking. We had to cover like 300 yards Yeah. (laughs) at an angle, kind of walking parallel to them, but, but we were angling toward them. So we were going from, you know, 120 or 150 yards we're going to end up at 50 yards yeah. from them. The closer you get, the less this technique works, right? right like, right. But we were walking along, and I'm like, it's working. They were just looking I, at us. and I couldn't believe it. I mean, we're, <laughs> we're plodding along. I'm looking over. These elk are just staring at us, and then they go back to feeding, and then they just start walking with you. And, you know, they're, they're still, I don't know what they were, 60, 70 yards away or whatever, mm-hmm. but... But they just weren't alarmed. And if some of them kind of ran off, the rest of them just kind of kept didn't mosey care. and didn't care. Whatever. Some of them were like, no, fellas, this, and, those are not, <laughs> those are not safe. Yeah. Uh, but most of the elk just were like, eh, uh, yeah, whatever. it's not running at me. Yeah. You know, whatever. It was crazy. And we used that technique to close the distance. And uh, that giant bull, I feel like I could have shot him, except it was wide open at first. But then they started hitting little timber pockets, and right. even though he was in bow range, it, there were trees in the way. Yeah, he was kind of flashing through, running around cows still. And, and he's not going to hold still. No. He's freaking out, so you'd have to be. Yeah. He did not But he's the bull I cows. wanted. He's the bull I wanted, so I'm like, okay. They finally hit that cut, and the two bulls collided. Yeah, and then and all their herds chaos. And at that point, I knew as soon as we dropped into the cut, our wind was going to go straight to the entire group yep right now it's been going diagonal and that's the other thing that we did as we were creeping along i kept checking the wind and it was blowing diagonal toward the back end of the herd and what would happen is the last 10 or 15 cows in the lineup would catch our wind every now and then and they'd freak out and they'd run to the front and leapfrog everybody right but the elk that didn't smell us were like whatever yeah they just stayed in the back and so we had like four or five groups leapfrog (laughs) leapfrog leapfrog (laughs) like we smell something but the rest of the herd didn't i'm like so we can't go too fast because if we did head up which i wanted to get in front of the whole group yeah the whole group would have smelled us so i'm like well we just have to pace our walk so we're we're going to matching the elk is basically what we were doing as they were moving, not move too far forward, but every now and then they did catch us, smell us a few, three or four or five at the back. Yep. And then boom, we got in between the two, they collided, elk went nuts. There was chaos. Multiple sixes were running around. I'm like, I'd shoot that one. I'll shoot that (laughs) one. That one's good enough for me. And then as we dropped in the cut, I, 
there's too much timber. Even though there's a bunch of bulls in range, I couldn't get any shots. It was chaos. Then the the elk smelled us like yeah, full on. Sure. Most of them smelled us, and then they just started running all over and up the hill. And the bulls, <clears throat> they're <clears throat> they're preoccupied with the cows and keeping the other bulls are away from them. Yeah. They don't. They might smell you, and they don't even care because they're they're so caught up in being the top dog, master of their universe, king of the cows, yeah. that they, they don't care that you're even there. Well, and I think in that situation, because there was so much chaos, th- those bulls were trying to prevent what was happening, right? I mean, they uh-huh. just were trying to keep their cows away from those cows. They, just, they were so focused on the chaos that I think they just didn't think about smelling and the wind, you know what was going on yeah. around them really and so we were able to kind of even though we created the chaos take advantage of the chaos you know as soon as we were in the cut they ran up the top and over and so yeah. we were left standing in the bottom of the cut and when i say run over like a bunch of them did but a, a lot There's of them still a bunch that, right. a lot of them sort of moseyed over and we're looking in the cut behind them like what is yeah. everybody running from right so i knew there were stragglers other elk kind of at the back end so as soon as they cleared the ridge, I'm like, now I can close the distance because there's nothing looking. They're all over. So I just sprinted to the top of the ridge. Yeah, and I'm like, what is he doing now? <laughs> like, first of all, we had just walked 300 yards, crouched over. My back was, <laughs> <laughs> I could barely stand up. I mean, I'm like, I don't the, your back you've got this like crater you know these you, you have actual back straps on your back <laughs> normal humans i mean my back was killing me at that point and well, all I of look, a sudden i look up and you're like full on running well when we were crouched over i started to see some elk looking at us and they were like they were getting all like concerned and i'm like i could feel your hands on my on my back and on my waist and i'm like and then i look behind me and you're vertical. You're standing up. I'm like, Bryce, get down, get down. It's like a head popped up in the middle of an elk back. Every once in a while, I had to, like, you know, do that little lumbar stretch to let, yeah. get my back. Okay, now I'm good again. Let's go. Yeah. You're like, my back is killing me. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> Crouch down. And so oh, it was kind of uh, uh, crazy. But you did. And uh, so when I sprinted up the hill, I, I had a hunch that once I crested the hill, that there'd be elk all over right there. Yeah. Like they like to run away, and then as soon as they feel like they've crested a ridge or whatever, there's so much chaos. I was like, who knows what's up there? Right. But this is actually a good thing. You know, I can close 200 yards, like in a sprint. Right. But, uh, finally, I can move fast. Yeah. So as soon as they crested, I ran up, popped the ridge. I didn't even know where you were. And well, at first I was like. Uh, Okay, Brian, go, go go do your thing. And then I was like, no, I got to see what's going to happen. Just my curiosity got the best of me. I'm like, okay, here we go. So then I just ran up, you know, as fast as I could to try to catch you. And uh, I crested kind of that, that ridge that mm-hmm. they had all gone over. And I, right as I got up there, you were ranging a bull and, uh, you know. I, I saw a bull that was a nice heavy five. Not quite what I've been looking for all week, but but I was like, I'll be I'd be happy with that bull. He's a nice bull, and uh, range him, get the range. I think I came to full draw, but he just started walking. Right. So I'm like, all right. So I sneak around this corner, get tighter on him, range him. He's like 45, about to shoot him there. He drops below, and I'm now cow calling every now and then, like trying to get him to stop. Yeah. I come up, I run a little closer, and I'm like, okay, this time I really headed him off on this. There's grass and little little rolling hills that are perfect for you to like, I could see his antlers the whole time. Yeah. But his head was too low to see me. So I'm like, like a shark fin in the water. I'm like, there he is right there. And I just, just, you know, got into position, getting ready to kill this bull. And I feel a tap on my shoulder and I turned to look at you and you're like, you pointed and there was a bigger six, like a nice heavy six walking I don't know, he's probably 80 or 90 yards away. But I could tell on the folds on the ground, like, I can head this bull off and kill him instead. See, I should have been selfish and let it, you go <laughs> after that five point. Right. And me go after this. But I was panting like a dog from running <laughs> up that hill. And I'm like, there's no way I'm shooting an elk right now. So 
I just wanted you to make make a good choice. Dude, when you tapped me and I saw that bull, I didn't even like look at you. I didn't even uh it was like kill mode instantly. Yeah, uh, the, there was something I could tell from the moment we started doing that little decoy dance walking like elk that you, something had flipped in you and it was like now is the moment. I'm I'm going to kill something in this moment. I think from that moment all the way through running up over the ridge to ranging that other bowl, then to switching to this bowl, you were just locked. And it was like, this is going to happen. And you took advantage of it. Yeah, I feel like um, the there's times to be super aggressive. Yeah. And it pays off. That was this, an aggressive situation. <laughs> you know, that was not a let's bite our time. Wait, this is like aggressive attack. Yeah. Take advantage of the moment. Don't be conservative. You know, you got you're you're gambling, you're throwing everything out there. Yeah, and I think the the fact that those elk kind of blew up the way they did, and they all kind of ran, and those bulls being as tired as they are from running for so many weeks or whatever, they were not paying attention to anything. They were just walking up behind the herd, just and you focused s- ahead. You see that so often, where when a herd spooks like that, and they climb hills like they did. Yeah. The cows don't have 50 pound of antlers they're carrying. They're not running yeah. all day and hitting trees and fighting bulls. They're not, they're not bull- exhausted. Yeah. And these cows, they just flit up these mountains and go and they leave their bulls behind. Yeah. And their bulls don't even try to keep up. Yeah. They're like, okay, I'll scent them out. I'll smell them. I'll fall. And they get, they get 100 to 500 yards behind and they're just moseying up and they don't pay attention because they're, they're just beat. And my goal was there's so many bulls. I'm like, there's going to be some stragglers. Yeah. There's going to be bulls just trailing this group. And I've seen the biggest bulls of the group be the ones le- the most left behind. They're the oldest. They're the most tired. They have the biggest racks. Right. Um, they're not built for what these lightweight cows are doing. And so yeah, that was the plan. And sure enough, that bull, I got up on him. And this was fascinating to me in hindsight. And as I've been mulling it over the, I ranged the bull and he's like 41, 45 yards as he's, and he's walking. He's not looking left, right? Nothing. He's just like, he's just walking head down. He's tired. He's just going. And I was like, this bull is going to die. Yeah. He's just, he's not, he didn't have cows to protect him. And he's not making any effort for, no. for survival. No, he wasn't. He was just kind of walking. Same with right the five the left. Yeah. that I almost shot. He just was like, he was a little more spry for sure. Not an old bull. He's younger. So this bull, uh, he's walking along and finally I get to a spot where I have enough open terrain where I can get a shot that I need him to stop. And he's like 45, 50. And I'm just ranging the whole time. And I'm like, mew, mew. And I'm doing some harsh cow calls like, yeah trying to get him to stop yeah. doesn't stop doesn't stop and it's like you know i'm seeing the ranges increase with every step you know it's like 40 45 50 yeah yeah and he's not stopping i'm like you stop so i'm like <laughs> on that call i just like whined and made some like funky sounds yeah it was crazy i it was 10 times worse than that <laughs> it was, i was like what is he doing now uh, and that bull just ripped right back at you that big bugle and i was like oh, i've i noticed worked. when they're tired and they're they're just beat and all that and they hear so many cows making t- noise they gotta hear like a really crazy estrus whiny sound like you gotta get extreme because the the, cha- the chaos was extreme yeah and so i was like all right I tried the harsh cow calls. I tried those. Didn't even bob his head. I'm like, and then I just went all whiny estrus and just was like, (laughs) and that bull stops and just goes, and I'm like, yes, I got the range. It was 61 yards, dialed the sight, and the bull had stopped, though. I was glad he stopped. I got desperate because I'm like, here I am trying to stop him, and I see him hesitate. But one more step and I wouldn't have had a shot because right. a, a huge tree, that big tree was, was no blocking his vitals. So I couldn't see his head, actually. Yeah. I couldn't see his front shoulders. All I could see was from like the third rib back. Right. And I couldn't see from his belly down because the, the grass was too tall. Yeah. So all I could see was the butt. So I couldn't see the legs on the front or the back. 
could right. just see a body. And I could see the crease in the shoulder. Like, you could see a little bit of the crease just as the tree comes down. Right. So I looked at the bull. I was already at full draw as I was analyzing the bull. And he just ripped one. And I'm like, I dialed Drew. And I was tr- trying to see his body where I want to put the arrow. And I was like, in a split-second decision, I kind of just was like, all right, that's the center. That's where I wanted to exit. And I thought I'd hit him right behind the second or third rib from the back. Right. Shoot. And instantly, and it was a fast shot. It was fast. Like like a couple seconds total. of. I put the pin there where I wanted it, held, 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 and I did the push pr- pull kind of thing that I like to do to kind of make sure I pull straight back so I get a good left and right. And I just, boom, let it go and punched him. And I thought this is that was the perfect shot. Like, that's where I wanted it. It was a little further back, but I had to choose to go back so I didn't hit that tree because I didn't have more to go forward. But I still thought it was uh, a double lung. And if it wasn't double lung, I knew it was liver, 100%. Right. So I knew this bull was dead. He Sure enough, he spins left, and I see this giant red blossom coming out yeah. right, right around the the uh, second rib from the back, right, middle of the body. And I'm like, he's dead. Money. He's dead. And my only concern is with a liver shot that it takes f- four hours to bleed out. You know, yeah. it's fatal, 100% fatal, but it's like it, they don't drop like when you hit them in the lungs and they just pass out or right. they hemorrhage like right there. And when a bull is liver shot, if he's pressured or got a lot of adrenaline, they can go a long way. Yeah. And if they don't bleed well, you can lose one. So I was a little worried about that. He spins, then he turns and he faces back toward the herd and he just stands there. And he's probably 80. Yeah, 80, 85, somewhere. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, I pull up the binos and I look and all of a sudden I freak out because his hind quarter is bleeding like crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, what? No, I hit him in the liver. I hit him behind that second rib. Like, how is there a hole in his hind quarter? Yeah. And so I was looking at it, looking at it, and I was thinking to myself, and then I realized that's the entrance hole. I saw the exit hole. Then I realized he was quartering away. Yeah. Pretty hard. Harder than we thought he was. I mean, he looked almost broadside when he was behind that tree. Because I couldn't see his but, front legs. Because yeah. I could have seen his legs were spread apart and his back legs spread apart. And yeah. then you could see, oh, I'm not looking at him broadside. I'm looking at him at an angle. Yeah. But when you remove an animal's head, shoulders, shoulders legs. and both legs, yeah. he's just, you can see his butt and you can see the curve of his hip and you can see the curve of his shoulder. But I couldn't tell that it was quartering away. And the grass was obscuring. I had a hard time getting reading. I kept ranging his horns. Right. Because... That's what was, I could shoot through the grass, but I couldn't necessarily range through the grass. So I think, you know, a lot of that aiming, I think, comes from, I've spent a lot of years shooting 3D at weird angles. And when I hunt out of a tree stand, I pretty much automatically aim for exits. Like I split the body in half, move forward a few. That's where I want the arrow to, to, to exit. I don't even pay attention to entrance holes. Right. And I'm, I've been shocked a few times where my arrow entered and where it left. But I think that's a really good habit to get into. Too many people look, shoot a 2D target or a paper target. Right. And then they get an elk in front of them and they go right behind the shoulder. Right. If I shot him right behind the shoulder, I probably wouldn't hit vitals yeah. with the angle he was at. Not even close. Well, we talked about that yesterday a little bit where one of our you know, methods to prepare is to hit as many 3D shoots as we can in the year. And we usually will hit, uh, you know, four or five 3D shoots over the summer Mm -hmm. where we're getting all those different angle shots on different body sizes, different animals, whatever. And it's really enlightening to be able to go up to that target and see the angle that your arrow came in, visualize where it's going to exit, and understand that that shot right behind the, you know, crease of the shoulder typically is not the best shot to take no i've been saying that to friends and people i hunt with i see more elk lost to people shooting too close to the front shoulder than anything else 
there's no excuse. You don't have to make that mistake. Yeah, people, especially on an elk. People tend to um, come to the crease and then move back. I quit doing that a few years ago. I come to the last rib or the middle of the elk and I move forward. Yeah. And if I don't hit both lungs, I hit liver. There's a big target zone there. But usually it gives you the most like you have four inches of leeway, four or five inches of leeway on the right. And you have four or five inches of leeway, more like 10 inches on the left Yeah, with that shot because there's the liver too. Right. So that's how I have been. And I'm hunting a lot of open country. So I'm more comfortable with a shot that's further back because I know it's 100% fatal, fatal in the liver if I, if I don't make a great shot. And in open country, I can see that animal go 500 yards, yeah, 1,000 yards. Right. Like I can, I can run up the next ridge and see where they go and they lay down and in thick timbered country i'm less likely to cheat uh that far back toward the liver and i'm i'm really going to try to keep it right in the pocket more because i know they got to bleed and they got to die quick or i won't find them yeah but even you know brandon's bull that he shot this year you would walk up on that bull and i think most people would go "Hmm, you shot it a little back Mm -hmm. you know just because it was probably almost exactly center of body, maybe, you know, a couple inches forward of center of body. Yes. Perfect height up and down, but, but that bull only ran 60 yards. That's and what he I had no, no life left. I mean, he just laid down and died within a that's, minute. That's exactly my experience. I'm finding like, if you go to the middle of the body and you come forward the same thing with bears, yeah. just a few inches, you have a better kill zone than when you're right up there in the shoulder. Also, because the lungs and the heart slope up from the armpit, basically. So there's a pocket in the crease where there's no lungs. Hmm. They, they, uh, they're not vertical. So the further back the lungs go, they feel the, to- the lungs go all the way up the to the top. back. Yeah. Right underneath the back. But up front, the lungs slope down precipitously down to where the heart is. If you look at the anatomy and you're like, man, there's a lot of, so your up and down is way smaller. Yeah. And then your left and right, if you get too close to the shoulder is way smaller. Right. So I just like aiming. I find the middle of the body, the last ribs, and I move forward. And now I have the biggest kill zone. I, I just find I'm not losing animals in, in shots. I mean, I, my heart has broken at times where I've hit animals in the, the shoulder or too tight up front and yeah, I blew through the shoulders, yeah, but it didn't hit anything. Right. Brad had that same experience this year, blew through both shoulders. Uh, if he had aimed more in the center of the animal, especially in that open country, I think he'd have a dead 340 bull. Yeah. And I think that again, aiming at shoulders or right in the crease is a habit people get into when you're on a 3D, even the 10 ring. We talked about that. Yeah. People keep score on 3Ds. I, I'm like, look, I don't care about the scoring. I want to shoot kill shots. So when I'm at a 3D and I am, it's an angled target quartering away or whatever, I'm not going to aim for the shoulder. I yeah. might shoot him in the, le- the right flank so it exits up by the left shoulder or something. Yeah. And so I try to put it where, and then when you get up on the target and you can see your arrow and its trajectory, and its angle, you're like, oh, I'd have missed his lungs actually at this angle. I need to shoot like right in this pocket. Yeah. And after you practice that quite a bit, you start to see these angles and angles are everything. Yeah. So with this bull, um, when I saw that, I, I, at first I was like, you came up and you're like, did, did you get him? R- right away you said, as soon as I shot, you're like, did, did you hit him? I was like, oh, he's dead. He's dead, Bryce. 100% dead bull. Uh, if I didn't get the lungs... I got the liver. He's definitely dead. But I think I got lung. Right. Because it was two ribs in, at least. And so I was like, I think I got it. Then I didn't, but I didn't realize at the time that he was quartering until he turned. And then I was like, then I realized the quarter. So then I pictured, okay, if it entered right at the front of the, which it did, it entered right at the front of the hind quarter, mid body. Yeah. It went through guts. Uh, went through liver, diaphragm, and I think the offside lung. Yeah. And so I was like, he's a dead animal. There's no surviving this. He's going to die. My concern then was I don't want him to know we're here or spook him because I didn't want him to 
run. Run, and he looked tired to begin with. And so he's just like, oh, I don't feel good. And liver, liver shots really make them feel, they seem to feel sick instantly. And so a lot of times, if they're not pushed, they'll just lay down. Well, sure enough, he stands there for quite a bit. Um, and then he, um, and you, you get that sick feeling as a hunter. You're just yeah, like, lay down, lay down, lay down, lay down, lay <laughs> down. And he ends up just kind of walking down a little slope. And I was like, he disappeared from view. As soon as he disappeared from view, we had a good wind that kind of picked up. Stormy little wind. And I'm like, it was a blessing. And we, we ran quickly over to the ridge he was on, peering through the grass, the tall grass, just trying to reveal a little bit of the animal at a time. There he was. Ranged yeah. him 45 yards through the grass, got a second arrow out, and, and finished him off. Yeah. And it was nice. It was nice to have it go down that way because otherwise we'd have been tracking this bull or waiting for him to die for hours. Yeah, or and miles maybe even. Right. Hopefully he could just lay down. But um, and then forensics. Once we got the bull down, he and he's a beautiful bull, heavy bull, heavy, really heavy. Yeah, lots of mass. He's definitely old, old crusty. He's got um, size, big old hump. Um, yeah, his body was very big. He just a beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful bull. bull. Yeah. Um, and uh, but not a high, super high scorer. You know, you don't get a lot of points for mass. Right. And I've said this. I'm a sucker for mass because mass. There's no no three year old bull has mass. <laughs> I mean, the only way you get mass, whether you're a buck, a deer, elk, whatever, the only way you get mass is with age. Yeah. There's no other way to do it. Well, you look at Brandon's bowl from this year, monster first, second, third, you know, but they're yeah. like, they're like spaghetti noodles. Yeah. You know, they're, they're so huge. Just frame. a young, just a young, good genetic bowl, but just could outscore oh. a bowl like mine. Oh, easily. But if he had the age, yeah. but he just didn't. Oh, for sure. That yeah. bowl had genetics that, unless my bowl was just declining, but I think he was, I think he just, that's what he is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brandon's bowl. At age three or four, um, you can tell had the potential to be, you know, a, a three forty or three fifty type bull. Yeah. The bull I shot, he's probably right at that his maximum size. Yeah. He's probably eight or nine years old. I don't, I don't know, somewhere in there, and uh, you know, he is what he is. But those heavy racks, they just get me every time. Yeah. That's what I like. He didn't, you know, when I first saw him walking out. Before I tapped you on the shoulder, I almost didn't tap you because he didn't look that big. Mm -hmm. But then I realized just how heavy he was. And I'm like, that is masking some of his size because he just carried it all, all the way, way through. Yeah. Short, stubby tines, but yeah, just heavy. Just heavy. So when we uh, got up on the bull, I was able to look at um, the shot and what happened. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, what had happened was... It went in through the front half of the hind quarter. The uh, height was pretty perfect. Yep. And the exit was, it was about the third rib in from the back, kind of in between the second and the third. And looking at that spot and seeing the arrow, it was like, it was, I would have liked to be a little more forward, but based on where the tree was, it's so funny in your mind, everything's happening so fast and it's automatic aiming for those exits. In order for me to get that arrow that far up on his left side, you know, his offside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to shoot him in the right hind quarter. Yeah. I mean, it was like almost a butt shot. <laughs> almost. It was, a, it was forward, you know. But it, it was forward was, of his front leg, yeah. but kind of in the flank. Yeah. But still, he wasn't broadside at all. Like, no. I was like, wow. Um, and then um, what we noticed, so I'm shooting the Valkyrie system. My arrow is 484 grains, and I've got that heavy front of center uh, Valkyrie broadhead, the J the Jaeger or the Jagger head, and it's 200 grains, and I have like 21 or 22 percent FOC front of center weight on the arrow, and I have seen that thing just zip through muscles and bones in a way that gives me a pass through that a lot of um, setups won't right. give a guy. Right. Had I been shooting a different kind of head or arrow that was much lighter they just wouldn't have accomplished what i accomplished with it yeah and um so that arrow was incredible the way that it passed through all that muscle um and 
the grass bag and everything yeah. else and then the liver and the diaphragm and then exit and the arrow came out and what we realized was the arrow actually got hung up somewhere and about five inches of it was sticking out had been sticking out the uh exit hole right so the arrow was actually we didn't notice at the time the arrow was stuck in his body yeah and i couldn't see it you know when i saw him briefly with all the blood coming out uh the blossom there right but that arrow was stuck in his body so as he um when he was standing there i don't know how much of it was still in his leg probably not it was probably all the way just mostly in his guts and it, his liver. yeah when we were cutting him up and i found that arrow it was you know the 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 fletchings, fletchings and the knock were pretty much right at right where it enters the gut you know it, it had it had gotten into the gut area and then hung some, up something hung it up and in the grass usually yeah. when you hit that gas that grass bag any arrow that can go through a bale of hay basically right. in their stomach <laughs> is a good setup yeah. you know because so many arrows once they hit that they got to go through basically uh, a pile of of hay yeah. that's all dense and compact and then it's got to stay sharp as it cuts through all that and pop out the other side and still do damage so i feel really confident with the the valkyrie setup that i can take shots at odd angles on an elk and they will get to vital zones i wouldn't take those shots with a different system because you can't and it's funny because for years i've been hunting blacktails they're much smaller daintier kind of critter yeah and you'd always get pass-throughs right and you could take angles well when you start hunting elk you're like i gotta wait for the broadside shot hope i don't hit a rib right and just take take what you get or I got to slip it behind at a quartering away, like right behind the last rib. Because if I go like the shot I took, it's probably not going to get up into the liver area or the lung. It's right. going to stop in the guts. Yeah. And that's not going to kill them that day. It's going to take two weeks or it's just a horrible way to die too. Septic shock is awful. Yeah. So um, I'm really impressed. But I also told you that my concern with the Valkyrie on elk is it doesn't put a giant hole, entry exit hole in the animal. They are they're still an inch and an eighth or whatever they are. It's a, it's kind of a small hole. Yeah, we compared that, you know, we talked about cuz I shoot those ram cats and those things put a gigantic hole yep in an animal. Um, and so we talked about some of those pros and cons, but they're they won't go through an ant, you know, cuz they're light. They're a 100 grain tip. Mm -hmm. And so And they have so much drag yeah, because they're like because of inch and a half wide or coming they're huge. Off of them. Yeah, and you just don't get that velocity and force going through the animal once they impact like you do those Valkyrie uh, broadheads. And I was super impressed at how far that arrow went all the way through and actually did come out the other side. It is a pro and con because I, as I talked to Brent Hahn about the Valkyrie arrows, he's like, he said, we when we did all our testing, as soon as we went over that inch, inch and a quarter, inch and an eighth, I, I should say, size he's like we stopped getting pass-throughs yeah. like there's something about magical about this the the whole size being able to have an arrow go all the way through the body as soon as you add that extra width you got all that drag but we were talking about surface area that's been cut right right a hole from the back hip you know to the front left shoulder through a whole animal and all the cutting that it does and two holes instead of one that's a lot of of surface area that's been cut. Yeah. When you shoot it with a Ramcat, it might be in five inches or four inches into the rib, but it's twice the size of the hole. Right. So there's a lot of surface area that's been cut. Yeah. Right. And what I have found is animals seem to bleed better and lose blood pressure faster, uh, often with a really big hole. Yeah. So like a Ramcat in this, in the lung, that animal seems to go 40 yards and just start suffocating quickly. Yeah. When I've shot Valkyrie through, boom, boom, like that, I've had the animal stay alive a little bit longer. It's going to die. It's 100% going to die. Sure. But it doesn't bleed as much because the hole is so much smaller. And elk hides are thick, and they tend to sometimes cover your hole. So you punch a hole through it on both sides, but the skin moves. And because the, the hole in the skin is still just an inch or so, 
it seems to um, kind of stop the blood from coming out like at rapid rates. Yeah. When you shoot them with a Ramcat, the hole is so large that even though the skin is shifting against the, the entry, ex, entry wound or exit wound, it, it still allows for blood to escape. Yeah. And the faster the blood comes, internal bleeding I've seen um, causes the animal to live, to be able to not pass out, not faint, not lose blood pressure uh, or hemorrhage as quickly. Right. It's sort of like you get you cut an artery and then you put pressure, put pressure on it. Yeah. You're not going to bleed out as fast as if you cut an artery and you just let, let it just it go. go. Yeah. Um, you're still bleeding to death, but it's a little slower. Now, on um, I only experienced that on elk with the Valkyrie. Uh, when I've shot deer and everything, it doesn't seem to matter, dude. Coast to coast and they pass they out in <laughs> 20 yards, you know, 40 yards. They right. just drop. But on an elk, it's a big animal. And when you're doing an inch and an eighth size hole, it's a pr- you're you're tr- doing a trade off. Um, and I've considered recently. Brent has come out with like a, a mechanical. I've considered recently, like if I am in a thick timbered area, and I need I want a bull to drop like right when I and I, or to bleed well, I might consider switching it up. I still want the weight if I can, sure, heavy front of center and all that. Yeah. But I um I kind of am curious about that setup. But in general, I feel I was telling you, I think I've the Valkyrie on elk has provided me with more success than had I not used it because I think back on all my shots and a lot of the animals I killed now with it, I had to go through an entire hind quarter like this and the guts and everything else to get through. I had to go through, let's say, a front shoulder or a chest. And I feel like uh, some of these shots where I had to punch through brush yeah. and bushes or heavy winds that kind of push your arrow. I found like it has been uh, the, the pros and cons. I feel like the pros are worth it. But like I said, if I am in Roosevelt country in Oregon and a, go, a bull goes a hundred yards and doesn't bleed, you're, you're hosed. Yeah. You're hosed. So I might actually switch it up to a, a whole, a, a head that puts a huge hole in it and drops it and then be also more picky about the shot because right. I've switched to a head that doesn't allow me to, to uh, do an any angle kind of shot. Yeah. But that's just anecdotal, you know, just my experience so far. But on an all other game, I don't ever see me changing it. It's amazing what it can do and the accuracy of the head. And I like knowing that this broadhead and this arrow I've shot a million times and I know where they go because I practice with them. Yeah. And then I sharpen them, and I'm... Well, that was, that's the really cool thing about them is you can resharpen them. You know, a lot of these broadheads, the ram catch, you can't really do that. Right. Right, it's... And I know that this head is flying at 90 yards good for me on this arrow. Right. Exactly, because I shoot it all the time. Right. If I have to unscrew that head and put on a different one with new blades, but then if I shoot it, I dole it, so I don't want to do that. Yeah. I don't know if that head is actually tuned to that arrow and that things are flowing right. Yeah, and exactly. I don't like that. I, I really do like to know. And I end up numbering all my arrows, and I have like a one through seven on there in my quiver usually. That's like this is my best arrow, my second best arrow. They're, and half of it's superstitious, okay? Like they're all hitting the target, but I'm like, I think this one hits it. <laughs> The best, best in the center, yeah. uh, with the exception every now and then with one that's just kind of not flying like the rest, one or two. Right. But generally, um, you know, the first five arrows are all the same, but I still have them numbered because <laughs> they make me feel good. Yeah. This is my lucky arrow. Um, but there's a lot of confidence that comes with that, knowing, okay, this arrow is just tuned for this 90-yard distance yeah. with a broadhead on it. You know, right. and too many people don't practice with broadheads early enough. And I prefer never to shoot field tips if I don't have to. Yeah, that's one thing. I think that's an area where I need to do more practice with broadheads. You know, I will do a lot of these 3D shoots, a lot of just regular in the evening target shooting. And, you know, it's usually not until a couple of weeks before season starts, right. you know, that that's pull the so broadheads common. out. And and then you're you know then you're all of a sudden going oh I need to adjust my sight you know you're just making so many last minute tweaks and changes that you don't feel a hundred percent confident always going out because you're 
messing with your bow right before season starts. I mean, luckily in Montana, you know, we've got that mid-August antelope mm-hmm. season that we go out and, and we have a good chance to dial everything in for a couple of weeks before elk starts. But yeah, making those last minute tweaks are never a good idea. And so, I, you know, I need to do a lot better of practicing with broadheads throughout the whole summer leading up to, to elk season. Yeah. I think it's a common mistake that people make. Then they're scrambling because they realize, oh crap, these heads don't fly. Then they go to mechanical because you don't have to have them tuned. They're right. going to fly like your field tips. Yeah. So uh, one of the reasons I like that Valkyrie system is because I can shoot those heads daily and then I can sharpen them and it's the exact same head for that arrow. Uh, I don't tweak anything, you know? Yeah. And the other thing is, is I can get those things wicked sharp. Yeah. Um, and if you don't, if you do have them, you can send them into, um, into Valkyrie and they'll sharpen them for you too. They like, they're like a Gerber knife yeah, or not a gerber a bench made where they'll sharpen them forever for you yeah that's awesome you can just send in all your heads just before the season and they'll sharpen them up uh i think it's free so but he does have those wheels that allows you to sharpen them from home really so anthony has the wheels and he's been practicing getting just better getting, uh... and they're just on a bench grinder yeah and uh you you got the couple of wheels and you just zzz, zzz, and then you can finish them and a guy that's really good at sharpening can get those things to be like a lightsaber like literally <laughs> like if they touch anything they just zoom go right through it like you're going to lose a finger um you can get them as sharp as wicked sharp as you professionally want to get them yeah. right if you put in the time and i ha- i will say that there's a dramatic difference between uh, even a Valkyrie that is like insanely sharp and one that's mildly sharp or pretty sharp. Sure. They're different. They, they penetrate and they cause bleeding differently. When it's, when it's so sharp, it's like a lightsaber. Every little capillary and every little like thing that's touched by that blade bleeds. Just, yeah. And it can't seem to close. It just can't seem to stop bleeding because it's such a per- perfect cut. Whereas when it's kind of dull, it punches a hole, but it kind of tears through. Right. And it leaves a lot. It doesn't cause the mass hemorrhaging like it does when they're sharp. Right. And I feel like most broadheads on the market, when you buy them from the store, they're pathetically dull. They really are. Yeah. Uh, and so if you can, if you can have a system or a head that allows you to really fine tune it, you can get those. You can get something that's wicked dangerous. Right. Um, and I really think that's so important. People don't pay attention to it. Yeah. Um, so anyway. You know, we did this whole uh, hunt. You helped me pack it out along with your brother yep. and uh, his son, Ben. That was a lifesaver because 10 miles in, it was it was going to take me days by myself. Yeah, it was a hump to get it out of there for sure. Yep. It was yeah. grueling <laughs> for four guys yeah. with, our, with, with a camp. camp, two camps. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you though, what are your, some of your tight ta- takeaways, some of the stuff that you walked away from this hunt you're like, okay, in the future, this is some things I, I'm going to start doing. Well, I, you know, I think the biggest thing, like I said, is just being open to taking different approaches based on the time of the season. You, we, we've always been kind of a one style with, with minor adaptions to it, you know, trying to find a bowl that's willing to play our game mm-hmm. and, and that wants to um, respond to a call and yep. come into a call. And you kill up bulls um, every year that way. And we do. Um, you know, you talk to my brother, I think it's 15 in a row this mm-hmm. year and, and our kids and nephews and everybody's been successful and, and we've had a lot of fun doing that. But this just kind of opens it up to... You know, sometimes we've called it quits on those weekends when we're like, mm, it's kind of dead. You know, we can hear them, but they're just not responding to calls. You know, that, that would be our comment a lot. They're just not responding to calls. Mm. And I think now we've got a different option on the table of being able to go in and say, you know, maybe they're not quite as active this weekend as they normally are. So instead of us trying to just force the animals to do what we want them to do, which they're not going to, We'll take a new approach now and a different setup and, you know, sneak down in and we know where they're at, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like we don't know where these right. are. So so now we can just deploy a new tactic and still have a opportunity in front of us. So that, that was one of the takeaways I think that was really good from this hunt. I think the other one was just, you know, the way we snuck in on those elk was so unique to me um, that normally... 
we would just kind of hunch over and walk, you know, our, you know, and try to sneak in, step quietly, whatever. But, you know, learning that elevation, your elevation of your body matters when you get that low to the ground and, and your, you know, the hillside acts as a backdrop and they can't really depict you from the mountainside right. and they just see maybe a little movement, but then it stops. You know, that just shields you better and allows you to get that much closer. One, one of the things you said was, uh, as we were doing this talk, was you put a whole new meaning to slow, painfully, like painfully slow. slow. Not just slow, <laughs> painfully slow. And, you know, people think, oh, that just means slow. No, I'm talking like your knees, your butt, your ankles, <laughs> your hands, they hurt because you're putting yourself in a city. And all of a sudden you got to freeze and you've got this rock jabbing you right in the <laughs> rear and you can't move you know <laughs> and you're, yeah uh, and it you know there was and i think you said that lamper says that if your knees or your rear or your feet or whatever aren't hurting at the end of a stock you didn't do it right right and so that was the takeaway you know is not only are you moving slow but you got to suffer through some of that pain a little bit to do it when i right watch way. ryan uh stock uh coos deer and stuff it was like you can't tell he's moving you know, yeah, right? And people don't. A lot of people don't have that kind of patience. It's not into. It. They're not into it. You yeah. know, they're not. They're not. Um, that kind of slow movement too is is hard. Right. Because we don't do that in our lives. Yeah. You know, and uh, and then when you are stepping over a log slowly like a snail, and you lay, you're, you're on your right leg, and you move your left leg, and your your left leg is move. You're doing yoga. Oh yeah. It's yoga. Yeah. There and, were, there were times I was like halfway over a log and you look back and you're like, stop. And I'm like, what do you want me to do? I'm like <laughs> airborne right here. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, I, I can like, I got the one legged squats down, you know, yeah, you do. And, uh, but I'll, I'll slowly, I try not to commit, uh, my weight to the next foot until it's on yeah. the ground, firmly planted. Then I shift. Yeah. So, Little things like that, you start to, and wearing stockasins really helps over time or, or a light boot, like Ryan uses that crispy Laponia, which is like a slipper. You're really able to like tiptoe around and, but what you find is when you deliberately put every step where it should be, shift your weight carefully. Um, I try not to be in a situation where I lose balance. So right. if I'm co committing to one leg and I got to go over, you see me use my bow as, as a, like a trekking pole, right? like a sissy stick. I just set it down. Now I have two points of contact Yeah. as I move through that third. And I use two, two points of contact all the time. Yeah. You see my hand on a log. You'll see my hand touching this, touching that, because that little extra stability gives you crazy balance it makes you more stealthy too i mean just, you can avoid unnecessary noise that otherwise you're making because you don't have that stability um and so you know i i think the other thing is as we kind of got in that decoy stance and we were kind of plodding along with those elk and i really you know a lot of times when you're hunting you're so target locked on the bull that you want you're just where is he what is he doing what's where's he going yeah where, where's my I'm opportunity bad. When it gets into it's, kill zone mode, yeah, I should have seen that six when I was about to smoke that five. Yeah, but I did notice that when we were kind of acting as elk and we're kind of plodding along, you were constantly, oh, your yeah. focus wasn't on the bull. It was on what are these other elk doing, and you were reading their behaviors and trying to kind of make a judgment call on how fast can we move? Do we need to stop, slow down? You know, what are we doing? And you were, you were more focused on all those cows because you knew if they blew up reading their body language over. and so once we figured yeah. out okay this is the pace yeah we're bumping a few and they're coming up behind us or whatever but it, it just put us in a better position right yeah, you can so tell. not getting so target locked as you're making the approach that you don't read what the other animals are doing yeah it only worked because we were uh patient i still we yeah. were still watching the wind yeah uh, we knew we couldn't get ahead of the group. We didn't want to lag too far behind. It was a time. It was like a perfect like yeah. timing. We couldn't walk too fast because then they like get alarmed. Right. For you to look like you don't care and you're just kind of walking hunched over like that, they're like, well, they don't care. They're they're chill. Their body language is comfort and right. you know ease. Yeah. They're not. This isn't a quick jittery animal. This isn't something that's going super sneaky. That's trying to kill me like a mountain lion. Like there's just 
they're just kind of like, oh, cool. Yeah. And reading that language is just takes a little practice, you know. Sure. But then when the moment came, you know, and, and you you did need to lock on a target, then you were locked. And I think that there was a, a confidence level that you had that was like, I'm taking advantage of this opportunity. I'm not going to miss out on this opportunity. And you didn't care what the cows were doing at that. You know, it was like, here's my target. I'm in range. I'm going full speed. And, and you just went in and, and made a great shot on a good bowl. And I, I just think that that was, you know, some good lessons for me of be aware of your surroundings, what's going on, mm-hmm. you know, as you're on that approach. But when it's go time, you know, get locked, get in take advantage of the opportunity it may not in the way you want it to but if you keep holding back keep holding it's going to get away from you right Right. so there's that there's that moment where it's like i got to capitalize on this and i got to take advantage right now i think that there's if you think back on this whole sequence of events i tell you all the time you got to be a dog with a bone let won't let go yeah like you got to stick with the play even though it looks like this hopeless okay they blew up Okay, this isn't going to work. Okay, that's over. It's like I've hunted with guys that kill, and they know, they don't quit. They don't give up on the situation until it truly is done. Over, yeah. And as long as there is like a sliver of possibility, right. you stick with it. And I look back on that scenario, and I don't know what you were thinking, but there, I've been with people that are like, this is pointless. Right. This, this can't work. It's over. Like, it's time to, like, hike back, get some dinner. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, it's so easy to end up throwing in the towel too soon. And that situation, it was like there was, it's too hard to get through this open face. We butt crawl. Yeah. Oh, they smelled us. They got up. Now they're ruined. We, we, We decoy. Right. We get down in the bottom. They run over the ridge. It's like, nope, we're going to run under the ridge and meet them at the top of the ridge. Yeah. And at any point, you could be like, give up get yeah. discouraged quit yeah. go uh it's not gonna work but but being able to like just go nope just to keep fighting keep fighting keep fighting you're just looking for that magic moment where that opportunity you keep throwing yourself back into the mix into opportunity zones because you never know what might just happen for you yeah. as soon as you walk back to camp it's done. that's done yeah yeah so there were several times where i was like this is not going to, you know, I've said it in this conversation. Well, <laughs> this is not going to work. I don't know why we're trying, Brian. <laughs> well, I don't know what universe you're on, man, but you're not in the elk hunting universe. <laughs> and it just kept paying dividends. You know, it just yeah. kept getting us closer and closer and closer. So anyways, it was a great hunt, great opportunity to learn new things and uh, had a lot of fun. And I always tell, you know, I'm a great pack mule <laughs> and I'm a great backcountry butcher. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm learning every year new things and and getting better every year. So, But I think uh, a new bow, a new, <laughs> a new RX-3, yeah. <laughs> it's going to help. Because what are you shooting, a spider? Uh, what no, is it? the Power Max. Power Max. The Hoyt Power yeah. Max. See, I think a newer bow, uh, it gets you more excited to shoot, for one, because yeah. it's new and everything. But uh, And then I think, I think you're going to enjoy trying not just calling and run and gun. Yeah. Like, I think you're going to enjoy like sitting in some sneaky spots, waiting in an ambush, Yeah, you know, or doing some as painful as it is, (laughs) some slow stocks stocks. into certain spots. I think, I think you're going to enjoy it. Well, like I said, we just have so many tools now, Yeah, you know, when it is peak rut. Yeah. You know, get on, on, we're calling, we're going to pull these boys in just like we always have and, and, and shoot a lot of elk that way too. But, when it's not, and normally when we would say, hmm, it's just kind of a dead weekend, we, we yeah. can try these other tactics and as be a, successful. As a father, I wanted to ask you, because your son, Brandon, yeah. killed his first bull yeah. archery this year. How old is he now? Tw- 21. 21. Yeah. How did it feel to, you know, just to observe him this year and then to, to see that success? Well, you know, his progression really... <laughs> He was a latecomer to the game, mm-hmm. right? Not like Patrick's boys who started at 12 years old, you know, really yeah. young. Killing at 12. Yeah. Brandon was very involved in athletics growing up. Sports. Sports. And sports. He was a big high basketball, school. high yeah. school player. And 
Yeah, he's Tra- travel teams. You know, yeah, he's he's stout. He's stout. Um, and so that was his focus, you know, growing up. And, and I supported that. I wanted to, him to do whatever he wanted to do. And when we lived in Colorado, it was like travel team mecca, right? Every every kid was on some travel basketball team, and every weekend it was this tournament here, that tournament there, and you know it was all year long. You were not a two sport athlete, three sport athlete. It was you did basketball, <laughs> and that's what you did, you know. And so that's what he kind of committed himself to in in kind of that middle school age, and that carried him all the way through high school. And but you know we hunted every once in a while. He'd come out every once in a while. He would definitely come in, pack out animals with us when we got one down. You know he'd he'd come help, but he just never really was like. I want to be a hunter, but after high school, you know, and you're no longer the superstar athlete, you know, going to the NBA or whatever, right. it's, it's kind of like, well, what can I do that's meaningful in my life now? What can give that's me? That's a challenge. Yeah. Like athletically and also yeah. mentally, yeah. physically. And so I just started to see this slow shift over the last couple of years with him of, I need to do something that's challenging still pushes me athletically um but can be a lifetime activity kind of so to speak and and so he he'd start to shoot a bow or he'd start to talk about hunting you know and and he just started to to get his mind in that mode and mm-hmm. and it was really not until earlier this year uh, you know probably in the springtime that you really just saw him all of a sudden go, I want to do this. And he actually started taking my bow. Yeah. Set it up for me. Yeah. And shooting it more than I was shooting. Um, and I kind of was like, okay, maybe he is serious, getting serious about this. And, you know, then I'd start to prep him and have the conversations of, um, okay, Brandon, well, this means you got to buy a bow. You got to buy clothes you got to buy the camping gear i mean i'm like this is not a hobby so to speak right this, this is, is an investment a lifestyle and a lifestyle and i'm like you're looking at probably three to four thousand dollars worth of equipment mm-hmm. right and i think that kind of played in his mind he's very money for conscious. the way you guys do it yeah mm-hmm. um He's very money conscious because you know we are camp on our back everything in yep staying in there We're remote yeah and so he kind of just kept going through that process in his mind, I think. And all of a sudden I saw him go out and buy some camo and mm-hmm. then he went and bought some boots <laughs> and then he went, and, you know, it was like, Hey, come, where can we get a pack from? You know? Yeah. And all of a sudden he's got all this gear, but no bow. <laughs> right? And I'm like, okay, well, you know, it'd be really good for you, Brandon, to come <laughs> yeah, along like, for a year. I'm like, this will be a good learning experience. You can come and just see and interact. And he's like, yeah, I think I'll do that. So here we are like a week before season. What does he do? He goes out and buys a new RX-4. Right? <laughs> Drops two grand on a whole new, a whole setup. new setup. And I'm like, all right, you're committed. Um, That's amazing. So, you know, and then we're trying to dial it in at the last minute, you know, get them all set up. But but then he came, you know, he's in college and, and he had classes. And so we were taking off a little earlier and going in and he would actually come in with Josh, his cousin, Friday afternoons. Mm-hmm. So he really only had, and then, you know, we're back out Saturday night because we've got obligations on Sundays. And and so he really only had Friday evening and two thirds of the day on Saturday. And so I, you know, kind of mentally was just like, I'm going to give this to Brandon, you know, I'm, I'm going to, when this he is gets, his year, yeah, when he gets if, in, if he, I'm not taking my bow out of my pack, you know, off my pack. It's, uh, I'm going to try to help him get set up, have opportunities, have experiences. And, you know, we got to, I don't know what it was that third or fourth weekend when he finally killed, but, um, it was just, and a smoker too. Yeah. Like I mean, a it, nice bull. It, it, everything was going wrong that day. I lost my bugle tube on the mountain. It was super windy. You couldn't hear anything. And in our style, we're like, it's over kind of, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we were just sitting there on that ridge. And I'm like, guys, it was him, his cousin Ben, Ben's wife, and myself. And it was kind of like, we have two choices, guys. It's blowing hard. It's getting cold. We can either just go back to camp and call it a day. Or we can go down this ridge to this point and hunt that on our way back. And so we just decided... Yeah, let's try it. And mm-hmm. we got down over this little 
edge and the wind kind of calmed a little bit. I just had a cow call, let out one cow call. This bull bugled back and um, it just, game on. yeah, game on. And, you know, I didn't have a bugle, so I wasn't bugling. Um, and I just didn't, you know, know what else to do. And I started raking a tree finally. And that bull broke loose from his cows. And all of a sudden, Brandon and Ben were in a perfect position and Ben was ranging for him and he made a great shot on a great bull. And as a father, I was just kind of like, this is, this is the best moment ever, you know, to see my son who hadn't really hunted most of his life to all of a sudden have his first bull down was just, I didn't need to hunt the rest of the season, really. It was just that gratifying. That's... Um, to see him do that. I was going to say, like, he committed to the whole thing. Uh, that's what I was curious about was he's like, I asked him the other day and he's like, I just decided I'm going to do it. Yeah. Is he like that? He is. He's when, just like, well, I'm going to find in, a way I'm going to do it. Yeah. In everything in his life, it's, if he has no interest in it, good luck. Good luck convincing him to do it. <laughs> right. It's like, he's like, no, I'm not doing that. And and there's no convincing him to <laughs> right. do it. But the moment that he says, I'm doing I'm gonna this. I'm going to achieve this goal. He's all in he's and all, he yeah. will do whatever it takes. It's remarkable. He, it. His first year, all this, just, I'm going to do it this year. Yeah. And guys and, hunt 10 years and don't kill. Well, goal. and I tell him, so. First, and he made first, the shot. First arrow. 50 out of the, yards. He's like, I'm probably one of the only guys that can say I've never missed. <laughs> <laughs> Sucker. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. You yeah. Know? Uh, we'll see how long that lasts, Brandon. But um, but he did it. And, then, you know, super satisfying as a father just to see that because you're just like, I don't. That's so cool. It doesn't happen for most people that way. No. It's yeah. really neat to, to, see, uh, to see that happen with a young man and then know that now he's got to be bitten by the bug. Oh, he's you know, totally like, bitten by the like, bug. It's like, if I can do this, you know, and... Uh, yeah, we got to get him on the podcast. Yeah. He's got to be next. And he's even more committed to just the, I just want to go now. And even if I'm not hunting because I've already killed, like, I just want to be out there. I want to help, um, which tells you that he really was bitten, you know, and it's not just, okay, I did this. Now I'm done for the season, but still wanting to go out and be a part of it, mm -hmm. even though he had nothing really to gain from it, except for pain of packing out another bowl. Right. <laughs> Um, you know, it's, it's just awesome to see that. Well, man, thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for the help thanks this year. We got lots of elk meat and meat in the cooler. We butchered it all up Yeah, and, uh, heading home today and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm grateful. Yeah. Anytime. Love doing it with you. And, uh, people can follow you what on, uh, peaks. Yeah. You know, peaks equipment, um, Instagram, it's peaks underscore equip um and and for people who don't know you're the the uh the owner of basically you came out with the sissy sticks yeah and that's how we met yeah i was like hey i'm looking for a trekking pole on instagram yep. on a story yep. hiking with my daughter and i was like anybody got a good recommendation and then uh, a bunch of people were telling me you got to talk to this guy and uh and then we talked and I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll use your pole. Send it to me, whatever. And then, <laughs> and then I really liked it. So, which I had low expectations. You know me now. I'm yeah. like, I'm so pessimistic. Oh, I on know. Gear. Every time I'm I like, pitch something to you, you're like, eh, yeah, we'll see. That. <laughs> <laughs> so check them out there, folks. Peace equipment. And, uh, and, uh, thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.